Hi, everybody, and welcome to another CaliCube Tuesdays. I'm Jason Barnard, the brand SERP guy from CaliCube. And today, a quick hello, and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Louis D. Camejo. Let's wasn't go. Right, was it? That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how, how does one say your full name? Uh, the Hispanic way is Camejo. Uh, the American way is Camejo. <laughs> <laughs> right, and the British way is Camejo. There you go. So, uh, you pick pick your pick your poison. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so lovely to have you here. We're going to be talking about how to turn content into profit, but it's specifically video content. Absolutely, that's right. one of so, the little verticals that we can go into, and I'm, uh, we feel very passionate because we produce a ton of video. So we're going to be talking about video content, and it was six levers of profitability. It's written very small and I'm getting old, so my eyesight isn't quite there. <laughs> and how to turn that into profit, which I'm really interested in because we've made so many videos yeah. and we're not making a profit from the videos. Interesting. We're making cool. a profit from the company. And a lot of the clients we get come through watching the video. So in a way we are, but it's indirect. So I'm sure you that's are. one of the, the approaches. We, get, we might have to change the lenses of how we're looking at that flow. Brilliant. Okay, we'll do that during the show. And um, before we start with that, I'm going to look at your brand SERP, something I do with every single guest. So I look up your name Perfect. and I see what comes up. And here oh boy. we have the result for you. Um, we can see the three photos down there. I think your name is unique because you've got the D in the middle. Yes. So that's my middle name. Uh, and why secret. did you put the D in the middle? Um. That's, I think that's part of the branding that we're doing, like the, I guess, rebranding moment that we're doing right now. We're trying to decide. So I have a middle name. My name, middle name is Daniel. And that's what it is. And then I also have a brother who's also a biz bro. And his first name is also Louise. So that's very unique on events. But I guess for search, might not be the best thing. So we're trying to figure out next step. And maybe you can help us here. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, 100%. And using the middle initial is, is actually a great way for somebody with a name they share with other people be it their brother or not, uh, using the middle initial is a great way to reduce ambiguity for Google and for your audience indeed. Uh, and I, I advise people to start thinking about that now because at some point in the future, there are so many people in the world who share names. Those who distinguish themselves with a middle initial or a middle name now are going to be hugely, hugely ahead of the field in three or four years' time when other people with the same name suddenly realize, I'm going to have to do that too. Awesome. So that's not common because in Venezuela, that's very common, right? We have we all have middle names, and I think being from there is it just happened naturally. It was not calculated at all. Right. Um, so I'm very oh, excited. Well, generally <laughs> speaking, people don't think to do that because we're so used to being known. In my case, Jason Barnard. Yeah. And if somebody says, "Oh, Jason M. Barnard" or "Jason Martin Barnard," I suddenly feel a little bit strange because I'm not used to it. But we had a client, Mark Preston, who changed in his name to Mark A. Preston. And what was surprising is he said after okay. three months he felt uncomfortable when they didn't say or write the A. Interesting. So even in our human brains, we get used to this thing that we think we'll never get used to because we've lived 50 years with a single name, Jason Barnard. And at yeah. the end of the day, Jason M. Barnard becomes incredibly natural very, very, very quickly. That's so cool. Okay, well, I'm glad we're on the right path and I'm going to lean in. <laughs> yeah, lean in, lean in, get it right. And here we've got the Biz Brothers podcast. Um, and I had Kevin on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about the fact that with podcasts, the great thing is that you immediately dominate your entire brand set, the search result for your name. Because of all these platforms, Apple, Spotify, uh, Podbay, YouTube, and even Podmatch for that matter could come up there. Yeah. Um, the podcast and podcast hosts have an, an, an advantage within the personal branding and um, online reputation or proactive online reputation management side because they control so much real estate in Google search mm -hmm. because of these platforms where you have both a podcast page and a profile page for the host. So awesome. It's cool, isn't it? Podcasting, best place to be. It's You're a podcaster. That's your huge thing. Tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. So the show is actually content is profit. And maybe we have to like talk off brand because that show that actually showed up there and full transparency. I love about the full transparency. That's not actually our show. So uh, that that was a show that was launched way before we launched content is profit. So uh, 
And wow. they they had it. Um, so our company name is actually Bizbros all together, right? And they had that show. It's not active anymore, but it shows up every time people search for Bizbros. It might be because it's so so after. So the show is actually content is profit. We're part of the Hospital Podcast Network. And uh, that's this is awesome. This is room for opportunity. I love this. Right. Well, because I actually searched for Bizbros, all one yeah. word, and it gave me the option to then say, did you mean? And then it sent me through to that result. So Google pushed me to it, and I didn't pay attention. And so, I didn't see that it's a health and fitness podcast. So I so, thought it was yours. So Google, no, Google and, took and it's, me down the wrong path. It's happened, right? So, I mean, how can we potentially fix that, right? It could be like BizBros slash Contents Profit or Contents Profit by, by BizBros. Like, how is this? Is it fixable? Do we have to go tell these guys? Be like, take it down? Like, what do we do? <laughs> no, well, no, that's the point is you can't you can't force people to take something down. You can't change your history. You need to figure out how to dominate. And it's all about domination. And so with BizBros, you need to become the dominant interpretation for Google of BizBros. Okay. Biz Bros. And so Google would then think, well, the, the biggest probability, the highest probability is Louis and his brother, the two Louis, yeah. and not these other guys. And then content uh, content for profit would become dominant for content for profit. So you would end up with the title with the two parts, but you would be dominant for each separately and for the two together. Interesting. That's the key. And that takes great marketing, great content, and great communication with Google. That's what we do at CaliCube all day, every day. Thank you for teeing that up for me, Louis. All Absolutely. of a sudden, I look smart and CaliCube looks like a useful service <laughs> for everybody. But let's get on to video content. We're not making a direct profit from video. And you said can, we can change the angle. Yeah, I think um, absolutely. So um, when people look at video or video podcasting, which is mainly the thing that we do, is they try to allocate revenue directly from that video, right? And sometimes yeah. we, we might have to, you know, if people don't click the tracking link that I have under that video or the affiliate link, it doesn't come from that video. And we, what we have to understand is sales cycles, depending on like uh, how big of a product we're selling, right? Or now we have a client that's selling airplanes. It might take years, right? It might take months. It might take maybe a week if somebody's like really mm -hmm. interested, for example, right? Uh, but they're different lengths. So what happens is like this video, which we call like this real estate, online real estate assets that we put online, whether that's a podcast, a YouTube video, and so on. We call them sales enablement assets, right? Because at the end of the day, it will help us move that person from not knowing you or knowing a problem, but problem aware, solution unaware to problem aware, solution aware, who's going to help me aware, right? Uh, yeah. So these videos are a piece of the puzzle or a piece of their journey to, to trust you. So we, we have this acronym called ART, right? Authority, Relevancy, and Trust. The more people consume your content, uh, the more they get familiar with you, the more you build authority with them, the more they respect you, the more they trust you, and then the transaction happens, right? So all these videos that we put out there, whether that's on social media, on YouTube, a little bit more uh, keyword uh, specific, or podcasts, whether that's personality-based or value-based, right? At the end of the day, it's just a small piece on that journey. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, one of the first pieces that we got to understand is like, okay, if that's happening, how can then I be consistent and then also leverage the time that I'm investing, not just time and resources, right? Because maybe people have teams uh, to make the most out of these videos and then include them in maybe a secondary way to outreach to our sales pipelines or right. to our ideal customers, right? How can I send it directly to them? Can they be part of our email list? Can I? How can I support them? Can, how can I put it in front of an audience, right? So we take a little bit of more uh, um, proactive approach when it comes to right. video, and then that's going to generate some traction. And all of a sudden, when you get to a certain volume, yes, those links are going to work. Right. So 100%. And I want to just, I think it's probably coming back a small step because people, the people in my team at CaliCube who are making video and contributing to the video, and there yeah. are you know, four or five people making the videos or pushing them out on social media, don't feel they're contributing to the bottom line of the company. I know they are, but I can't give them a number. Yes. How, how do you create a situation where the people creating the content, helping us with the content, getting the content out there, understand that they are contributing to the bottom line? And how, even worse, how do you get the boss of a company who doesn't understand that to understand that? Yeah, that's really that's a really good question, right? And you might have different answers to different people. Uh, it could be where 
if we go completely left field and it's like completely crazy idea, it's like, okay, turn off the, the video for like a full month, right? What happens? Ooh. Are the sales going down? That's probably a negative. Uh, that's probably a negative, right? And be like, okay, that's a great way to show that, <laughs> that the videos are actually contributing to like getting leads or closing deals or moving things forward, right? Probably we don't want to do that, right? Because you said you believe it, it's it's still working, right? So, you know, one of the, uh, my past is I was a studio manager, a fitness studio manager, and we had a, a bunch of studios where have about, uh, 10 locations. And one of the things that we used to ask every single person that came into, into the studio is like, hey, how do you find us? Or, yeah. hey, uh, do you watch any of the videos that we put on social? And they'll say yes, or they'll say no, right? Obviously, that's in person, but there's tools online that we can, you know, we figure out that we can do that. So that they could be like tracking links to see like how many people are watching that videos. Or if it's inside of your website and you send it over in a newsletter, uh, does that customer, can, the, is there a way that we can actually track on the back end to see if they actually saw the page, if they actually consumed the video, right? Maybe we're sending, it's not a social media video, but maybe it's a Loom video. We can see like how long they they watch that video, right? So maybe there's a part of the process where it's like, hey, have you seen any of our videos on YouTube? Have you seen any of our social video, social media views, right? Maybe it's in the submission form and the contact form. It's just like a yes or a no. And then you can actually directly start like tracking that. But here's the other thing. A lot of people tend to look at the video analytics or the video data very close to it, right? So a lot of people are like, hey, send me the weekly metrics, send me the daily metrics type of deal, right? And they're so in it. Here's what happens. There's a long tail of content that lives in the web, right? When people search for you or search for your yeah. guests, your, your content shows up for your topics, right? And there's people continuously downloading those episodes on the back end that we might not see on the weekly thing. So then if we Step back and we're like, okay, over the past six months, what is the process? Are we growing? Are people clicking the links? Here's an example. We build tracking links for a podcast for every single platform that we're in. So we have a tracking link specifically for Instagram. And this link specifically, the job is to take people from social to listening to the show, right? <clears throat> so we do Instagram. There's another one for YouTube shorts. There's another one for a LinkedIn post. And it's very specific. It's built into the flow. Now I can go through that link and I'll be like, okay, I know in Instagram, 9% of the people that click on that link will transfer and listen to the show. Hmm. That, that's my connection. YouTube on the other side, there's, a, the, there's like three times more the clicks, but only 2% transfer to the show. And in that moment, in that step in our pipeline, we are selling the show, right? We're not selling any other product. We're just selling the show. Uh, and here's interesting, like we learned that people on YouTube like to consume the content on YouTube. So the second we switch the link to, instead of listening to the show, hey, here's the full episode on YouTube, then YouTube downloads went up. And then when they come to us, then we're like, hey, where do you find us on YouTube? Do you find us on social media? That's the only way of video that we produce. They say yes. And almost 90% of them say yes. So if we spend, <laughs> if we turn that off, then game over, right? So how can we play it with the data? How can we play it with the things that we're doing? What are, where are our marketing efforts? Are they on email newsletters? Can we track that? Yeah. What's the number? Uh, is it on video marketing? Can we track that? What's the number? And then if we ask the people that come into our world, how do they find us? Or if they consume any content that we're probably going to get very, very close to that, right? We can get very technical and then tracking links and different things and track on yeah. the back end if they actually watched it. Uh, but that's a very simple way where we can start asking the right questions and seeing if people are actually seeing our content. Right. And I mean, the other thing is, of course, is, as you say, if you get data for a period of time for a platform as to watches and then conversions, you then don't necessarily need to track everything because you can say, well, we can assume that overall with our content, this is going to be more or less the case on this particular platform. And the details of it perhaps don't matter so much, especially in our cases as CaliCube, where we're educating people with the videos and the, yeah. the sales process the to get them down the funnel is very long. It's up to a year, sometimes more, and it's very yeah. high ticket. Absolutely. So, yeah, like you mentioned, I mean, that is probably just a little step in the process. I mean, some yeah. people might not even remember that they saw a specific video, but they remember your brand. So at the end of the day, we're talking about brand equity, right? Like what's that real estate, you know, that you guys are taking on the video side? That's also helping yep. and adding value, right? Um, you know, it's it's very similar to sales to a book, you know, an author. Where, where do they do a book, right? Mm -hmm. Can you actually track sales directly from people that read the book? It's really mm -hmm. hard, 
right? So they might, you know, some modern books have a ton of call to action points inside of them that they can actually track people from the book to maybe the next step. But the yep. next step is not a high ticket offer, right? It might be, hey, here's the guide to implement the book or here's a community or X, Y, Z, right? It's a step on it. But these are small pieces of the puzzle that if we can get consistency on it, I'm making sure that, you know, the machine works together. We're like, okay, this specific message is for the people that are learning from us. Are people learning from us? How do we know that? Are people consuming the content? Yes, thumbs up. Are people liking the content? Are people engaging with the content? And then some of that percentage is going to transfer to your next phase. And I think it, it's, uh, it just triggers a conversation, right? For every company, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, but if we start asking those questions and moving a little bit away, I'm maybe seeing at six months of data, like what's happened, right? Uh, yeah. With these videos, I think it can be really interesting. And you're making a really, really good point about the fact that all of this is step by step moving somebody closer towards the goal, which is your conversion, be it a sale or a podcast listen. And in the case of a sale, especially is getting people off the, the path if they're not going to be a suitable client because you don't want to sell to people who aren't going to be satisfied with what you're offering. And that's step by step by step by step by step by step by step. And I said lots of steps there on purpose in order to demonstrate there are a lot of steps, a lot of Absolutely. touch points. You can't measure all of them and measure the value that each one brought to the initial, to the eventual sale or the podcast listen. I wanted to dig into your six points, though. Yeah. Because I did say to you, I often forget when somebody's <laughs> got six points, and I want to make sure we get them. So no, you're going to pace this. Yes, absolutely. So obviously, you know, really good question. But then at the end of the day, that doesn't matter if we're not creating consistently and we're not creating frequently, right? At the end of the day, it's like, how can yeah. we build a machine that that we can sustain for a long period of time? And again, it can it doesn't have to be the same machine. That machine will evolve or the type of content that you create, right? It could be YouTube videos specifically. It could be podcasts. Um, by the way, bonus here for the people that have podcasts or content, collaboration with your ideal client or person or partnership is the fastest way to actually monetize that content. It's not oh. the front end audience, it's the back end audience and the collaboration that makes it happen. So for example. Oh. So it's a yeah. charm machine. Is it what? A charm machine. A charm, exactly. Because at so the end of the day. charm people, yeah. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, like if we spend an hour together, you're gonna get to know my personality. I'm gonna get to yeah. know your personality, right? We might be like, okay, that's a great fit. Or maybe that's not the right fit. But do you know people that could be a great fit, right? So mm. that collaboration is the fastest way to cash in your company. At the end of the day, it could be referrals. It could be introductions. It could be oppor speaking opportunities. It could be, hey, they become a client, right? There's many ways. So. Bonus for that, I think like that golden nugget in there could help a lot of people because that's the change of perspective that we had with our show initially because we had no downloads. But the person that came to our platform, we were able to develop a relationship and go from there. Now, once you get that ball rolling, uh, over the last four years that we've been producing podcasts in, in our studio for other people uh, with the fractional content teams, we've identified these six areas where we call them levers because you can like dial it down or dialing up depending on like how your process specifically is. So people come to us specifically with a content production problem, right? They're so busy creating content every single day. They're like coming up with ideas, recording it, and then, you know, maybe promoting it or distribu distributing. So as soon as we handle the production aspect of it, uh, people then, well, we're not selling. So there's a monetization issue, right? Or, hey, I ran out of things to say. So there's like a creation issue. So we kind of created these buckets where if we identify and and target that specific problem, then your content will move a lot faster for a long period of time, and it's going to help you move the needle in your business. So here he goes. The first one. So just just really quickly, I wanted to make one point: is a yeah. lot of us think we can do it ourselves, and I've done a pretty good job at CaliCube building a team, and we do do it ourselves, and we're doing fine. But we don't have that breadth of experience that you have, so we're making mistakes that we wouldn't make if we were working with you. That pretty much fits the bill, doesn't it? Absolutely. We, I okay. mean, that's, and that's with every single company, right? At the end of the day, there's going to be elements, right? That started, that, that happened with us when we first started on our side, we were, me and my brother freelancing and we're like, these are the, all the things that we've been doing. And then we started helping other people and like these six things continue to show up in this, right? right. So how can then we dial up? And sometimes, you know, you might not have to hire a team for all six, but maybe you take care of four and then we have somebody helping us with two of those categories, right? At the end of the day, it's like, right. uh, so we could be a six, you know, executing on this, but then it's like, if I remove myself from uh, item number one and lever number two, 
can we hire somebody that takes that six to attend? And then what happens is the content starts to get better and better, right? So here's here are the faces, Perfect. and then we can dive into specific questions that you have. So the first one and, is sorry, and yeah, I was going to say number them so that we can follow this. Yeah, absolutely. So number one is a famous what to say, right? WTS. <laughs> uh, it's like what do we actually say on on the content that we want to create, right? And this is going to be obviously platform specific, right? If you are on YouTube, uh, if you're an entertainer, or if you're hey, I want to add value. Uh, what is the thing that we're going to say? So often that involves research or ideas or all these things that then we can turn into content, right? Second phase, and then we can dive into this, right? Second phase is we call it creation. It's like, how do we actually create the, the content, right? Am I sitting down in my home studio and talking to a camera? Am I going outside and recording with my cell phone? Like, what's the actual uh, action of mm. creating the 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 property or or the show? The third one is the production. How do we actually turn that creation or that recording, that raw footage that we got or raw essay that we wrote maybe into a final product for content, right? A final YouTube video, a final podcast episode. So there's going to be mm -hmm. some elements in there. The next one is like monetization, right? Actually, I'm skipping one. The fourth one is distribution. How do we actually take that final product that we created and put it in front of people that we can help? Right. Mm -hmm. And often that's the number one <laughs> that people ignore because we spend so much time researching, creating and producing yeah. that then we're like, oh, we're going to put it out. And just by the fact of putting it out, we believe that people are going to come to us. No, we have to market <laughs> the marketing. So we're like that distribution can be obviously organic or paid, mm -hmm. depending on how speed on the channels that you want to you know, distribute. And the next one is monetization. How do we actually are connecting that content that we're creating? to our business, right? How is this getting us results for some people? Depends on, you know, what you're selling. If you have a very high ticket item, longer sales cycles, how can, how are we placing the content or distributing the content yeah. that we're producing to help? Or if it's a low ticket item, you know, how are we helping and guiding people into those funnels, for example, right? And then the last one is the management of all of this, right? How do we manage the idea? How do we manage uh, the creation process? How do we manage the production process? How do we manage when leads come in, right? So all these six phases is what we've identified as these big buckets that we can control and pull levers or stop depending mm. on like what part of the process we're in. Normally, uh, what we've seen is like a lot of people are stuck in the first three. Like how do I actually come up with ideas, research that's relevant, keywords, all this stuff to then create and remove the friction from the creation. And then how do I actually produce the final product? But then once that is that gate is like lifted and we're solving for those, then we have all this free time. And then we are, we need to optimize the other three. Now I have a team on production that I have to manage, for example. Hmm. Or my offer might not be as good as I thought it was because <laughs> people are not responding to it, right? What's the hook on the page, right? And there's all these little elements in there that we can start optimizing. So and that's that's a big summary. Things so yeah, no, that that's a great big summary. Now there are, there are a couple of things. Number one is yes, the first three is often done and dusted, and that the whole thing of the monetization is saying not only is my offer good enough or is my offer appropriate enough, but am I presenting it in a way during my videos, during my podcast that makes sense to my audience, and presenting it as the solution to a problem that creates paradise the exactly. wonderful situation, the dream situation the, the potential client is looking for. And we've been doing that very badly. And I was talking to Kevin a couple of days ago about exactly that. We're not presenting it right. And that's yeah. a huge problem. But the other problem that I didn't think about at all was management. And I think that's this kind of fluffy problem that people don't think about. And it doesn't really mean anything to me because I'm saying it's not a thing. Yeah, until it is a thing. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, at what point does it become a thing? Because I can um, see I need to manage this, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't seem yeah, real. And, to me. and, you know, well, it doesn't have to be you, right? You could have somebody that can manage it for you. But here's the thing. Like, let's say, you know, we've we've had interviews with people like uh, ourselves, too. We produce three podcasts a week. Each podcast has four to five clips. Then there's some promotion. There's some LinkedIn articles that are coming out. So every single week we have 50 plus individual pieces of content. That's not per like that's not a piece multiplied by platforms. That's like individual piece of content that has to go out. So how do we track all this? How do we write the captions for all of this? How do we how do we do this? Is that uh, that's a job on itself, right? We have a podcast manager that's handling all that. 
uh, how do we ensure that content goes out consistently every single week? So until we conquer the what to say, how do I create it and how do I produce it? And even distributing, right? We're so busy with those that we don't even think like, okay, in a year, we're going to be producing this volume of content. How do I plan ahead to mm. make sure that I have the pieces in place so we can actually support that production? Because one of the first exercises that we tell people to do is like, do a time study with your team and a time study with yourself on how much you're spending per area, right? So the very first time that we did this, we tried before the show was actually a thing. We tried for two years trying to publish consistently and we tried YouTube, we tried social media stuff and we couldn't nail it down. And we're like, but why, right? So we did a time study and we saw that in our day, we were freelancing at the time. We actually had about an hour a day that we could invest in content. So if I do one interview on Monday and then trying to figure out the research on this person. It takes me about an hour a week, right? And then we recorded another hour and then we produce it. Editing the video is going to take me two hours. Then it leaves me one hour to actually distribute it, right? Is that enough? Yeah. So we need to, so. exactly. <laughs> and now we do three, three a week, right? And uh, so how do we went from not mm. creating content to actually creating three episodes a week and X amount of content on the back end and testing things out? is we did a time study and we're like, okay, how do we remove the friction in these six areas? So the, the, the decision for us at that time was because we had to do it and we don't have the time and we wanted to publish daily, that was the goal, maybe is a live video every single day because mm. here's, the, here's the reasoning behind that. And we did it through a challenge that we created called 45 Live. We went 45 days of Facebook Live, right? And we triggered uh, consistency. So... On the research side, I'm going to decide on a very simple framework. I'm going to tell a story of something that happened to me or something that I learned, and I'm going to relate it to a lesson in my business and then do a call to action to my business. That was my framework. So I didn't have to do a ton of research up front or learning because I was already consuming books. I was already listening to podcasts. So I will reflect on something like that. That helped me save a ton of time on the research side to trigger the creation. The creation, very simple. I'll just grab my phone on my scheduled time in my calendar. That was at noon. And I will walk out of the office and record my reflection every day at noon. And uh, that kept me going for every single day. Production, zero production, because it was a Facebook Live. It went from creation to hitting the button and publish, right? Distribution, Facebook Live. And sometimes I will grab that same video and put it on LinkedIn. And then how do we monetize? We do a call to action after every single video and we communicate with the people that are commenting on those videos. And then how do we manage it? Very simple. In a spreadsheet of like today, I talked about this topic and it was published. Tomorrow, I talk about this topic and it will be published, right? Well, guess what? That format after 15 days helped us connect with somebody that needed our service and that client became a six-figure client. That's how we made our first six figures. We didn't have a podcast. Yeah. We didn't have anything. It was just consistency. And then from there, we apply that same principle. It's like, okay, if we want to publish a podcast three times a week, how do we manage all the six phases so we can actually be consistent? Because we truly believe that that's going to help us out, right? So that's the first step. We have to believe that the content is going to help us out. And then how do we set up the environment so we can start producing consistently and testing and learning from the data that we're getting? Right, brilliant. And that, I think that's the point. And for me, the key is... Just going out and creating this content is something I've always done, but I don't think about how I'm going to monetize it, how I'm going to distribute it, how I'm going to get it in front of the people who actually need to see it in order to bring business to me, and how I manage it so that, as you say, reduce friction, reduce wasted time. And for me, wasted time isn't so much a problem of paying people to do something that we could have avoided. It's wasting human people's time is a terrible thing to do if you can avoid it that was absolutely brilliant so we're going to come to the end of it which is the final question <laughs> one minute louis on how does video content help with branded search oh baby good question <laughs> so uh obviously this is something that we're uh we're learning from every single day but on our side you know, we try to have our brand present in every single piece of video that happens. Like, obviously, I'm wearing a sweatshirt with Biz Razan, right? On this side, I don't know if you can see the whole thing, but it says content is profit. If I'm not in this background, we'll have a, like a Zoom thing that says content is profit, Biz Rose, because we're online so much and that people will start recognizing it in our emails, in our videos that we send for outreach, in our every single piece of content has to have some part of branding, even if it's like a small logo or part of your environment, right? Subconsciously, we're also doing that. So we even 
That's worked so well that every time we go to events, people are like, oh, you're the Vizros or you're wearing the same sweatshirt that you have in every single piece of content that you're wearing, that, you, that, that you're recording, right? But you guys are the content is profit, guys. It's because it's present in every piece of video that we create, right? We set up the camera angle, so the logos or the graffiti or the names are there. And it is proven, again, one of the things that maybe we cannot measure one-on-one, -on -one, but it's also our identity online. And uh, we see it every time we go to in-person events, people recognize it and people will see you and people will talk to you. Uh, and it's been great to open indoors. So hopefully that helps. Brilliant. And all of that, and it's, it's beautiful, is all of that drives branded search and branded search i.e the number of searches that google sees with a brand name in it is super vitally important to google's perception of the importance of that brand to the audience that that brand can potentially reach so branded search is a signal a clear signal to google of notability importance and relevancy to a particular audience driving branded search should be your number one top priority in my opinion thank you so much louis that was absolutely brilliant Absolutely. We've got lots of handy hints for Caddy Cube, and I'm pretty sure that the six steps we don't have in our SOP that we sell as part of the Caddy Cube process to our clients. So Anne is now going to go in, figure that out, put it in a vanilla SOP that we can then transform into a product we can sell to our clients as the Caddy Cube process when they need a podcast. Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. Gems of information for us and for the audience. Thank you, everyone, for watching. But before you go, announcing next week, Trisha Daho, Hybrid Workplaces and Intentional <laughs> Cultures. I'm really looking forward to it because I've got no idea what an intentional culture is, and I'm not 100% sure what a hybrid workspace is. So that's going to be super delightful. Please pass the baton, Louis. Yes, absolutely. Trisha, I'm so excited that you're going to be coming to the show. I can't wait to learn. I think I have a hybrid workspace, but I'm definitely going to be tuning into your interview. So here's the digital button. Go and uh, crush it uh, here on the podcast. And I hope everybody else enjoys it too. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Have a lovely, lovely, lovely week because today is Tuesday. This is Caddy Cube Tuesdays. I'm Jason Barnard, the brand set guy from Caddy Cube. And I have Louis Di Camejo. That oh, was probably wrong perfect. as well. You were you sounded Venezuelan either. <laughs> Brilliant. And I'll sing it. <laughs> A quick goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Louis.